and I'll, I'll bring them tomorrow. Um, all right, so a couple things, just reminders. Uh, your outline is due on Thursday for art history. Um, logic workbook due tomorrow. So those are those little slips that I gave you. Um, I haven't graded the previous one, so I'll just grade all of those. And tomorrow? What else? Tests coming up sort of-ish in like in two weeks, two weeks and three weeks. The second and the twelfth. October tests are the best test. What's that? Our test. Oh, um, some of the definitions. So um, on that note, the, the definitions, so the bold points, sh 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 the bold points that are on the handouts, um, fill those in. Have those done by Thursday. Okay. So like the anneal or furnace, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you don't remember what they are, just um, look them up. Okay. Um, you don't need to hand it in, but I'm just going to check and make sure you have it done on Thursday because you're going to need it for a test. You can just say what they were. If you have questions, I can help you with it. Okay? Yeah. We can, we can go through it. Sure. The crucible. The crucible is the thing that holds the glass. Yeah. The glory hole is the thing that you are sticking the thing in to get it warm, to get it hot again, to get the thing warm, to do the thing. That was that. That was the thing that he opens up and you, you were sticking it. The furnace. The furnace is the whole thing. The crucible is the pot that holds the glass. Mm -hmm. uh, so the heat. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't talk much about the difference between a blowpipe and a punty. A punty is basically um, a long pole that you use to like transport some things. You guys were basically just using uh, blowpipes the whole time. So you can tell what a blowpipe is because it has that little tip on the end that you can blow through. That would be a punty. That That's a punty. punty. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. All right. So today we are talking about... Um, we're going to do two classes on Aegean art. Where's the Aegean? Roughly. The Aegean Sea? Geography? Okay, we'll get there. Don't worry about it. Uh, I'll show you maps. Um, why do I have Atlantis here? That's where people thought it was. Yeah, that's where people thought Atlantis was. So we're going to be talking about two major civilizations. We're going to be talking about one today and one on Thursday. The Minoans and the Mycenaeans. The Minoans um, are the focus of, of this one. And there's a lot that we know about the Minoans. There's a lot that we don't know about the Minoans. And so I'm going to introduce a concept that we've talked briefly about um, before, but it really makes sense to talk about it here. And this concept is called epistemology. I um, love Calvin and Hobbes, for the record. Um, epistemology is a subset of philosophy. You're going to want to write this down because it's not in your notes, but it's up here. Um, there's a lot of different definitions about it, but broadly, it's a branch of philosophy. So what is philosophy? What's the definition of philosophy? The science of what? Thinking. Of sure. knowledge. knowledge. Of how we, of, of thinking, of knowledge, right? So philosophy. Philosophers try to understand what we know, why we know what we know, right? This is epis epistemology. Epistemology is a branch or a subset of philosophy, and it is entirely tied up with the study of the nature, the knowledge, and the scope of knowledge. The nature of the origin, sorry, and the scope of knowledge. Um, if anyone else is watching this who's taken philosophy, they're probably going to shudder at my definition. I'm giving you more of a definition that fits what we're talking about here. There are more philosophical definitions of epistemology. If you ever take, enough, if you ever take a philosophy class in college, you're going to have an epistemology, uh, a better definition. Uh, but essentially, boiling it down to its bare attributes, epistemology is how do we know what we know? So I'll ask you.
broadly speaking. How do we know what we know? How do we know the things that we know? There's a few different ways. School. school. So what is school? School is someone teaching, someone telling you. So someone that you trust is telling you something, right? So I'm telling you what the definition of ep epistemology is. And you trust me. And if you don't trust me, you can go and you can look it up. And you might go, oh, Mr. Latham was a little bit wrong. I've already told you this definition is not exactly the philosophical definition, right? All right, how else do we know what we know other than someone telling you something? That's also someone telling you something. Same sort of thing. Experience. experience, yep. You learn through experience. And what's the third major way we know things? Nope. Well, yes, but no. So, yes. Senses. Our senses. Senses. <laughs> right? Our touch, our feel, our smell. Right? Our hearing, all that stuff, that's how we know things, right? So epistemology, this, what epistemology is, is the study of how do, we, how do we get knowledge? How do we, you know, the nature of knowledge, the scope of knowledge, the origin of knowledge. And so in this class, we're going to take a little bit of that and we're going to say, how do we know what we know about civilizations, about ancient civilizations? And art history can tell us quite a bit about it. A lot of the stuff that we have been looking at, especially with the Egyptians and so forth, um, is not specifically art, especially when we were talking about the ancient Near East and the prehistoric stuff. That wasn't necessarily art. When we were studying cuneiform, that's not really art, but that's epistemology. We're learning about a culture based on what, we, what they've left behind. And the Minoans are a great example for us on this, and we'll get into that. Just to give you a rough timeline of where we are, this is our fancy timeline of Egypt. So Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, New Kingdom, and Ptolemaic period. Where we are in this, we're going back a little bit. So basically from here to here, right at the end of the Old, old Kingdom, and basically extending all the way through the Middle Kingdom, so 2000 BC to 1500 BC, is the great extent of the Minoan influence during their kingdom during their civilization. It's short, it's shorter than the Egyptians. Spoiler alert, every culture we're gonna be studying about is shorter than the Egyptians. Uh, but this is where the Minoans kind of fit in this, in this timeline. So again, with art history, we can't always go chronologically, otherwise we'd be talking about Old Kingdom and then Minoans and then Middle Kingdom and that just doesn't make sense. Okay, so that's where we are, just to give you some, some concept. Where physically are we? So here's Greece, here's Turkey, Italy's over here, Egypt is down here, northern coast of Africa is down here. So this is in the Mediterranean, and basically we're looking at Crete specifically, also we'll look at Santorini, some of these islands down here. This is the Aegean Sea. Here, The Aegean Sea is where Odysseus was traveling, right? So that was where he spent a lot of time, and he was, he was talking about, you know, going through all these different islands and so forth. Um, he was bouncing around these islands for, what, 20 years, however long he was? It was a long time. Yeah? How long did it say that the Minoan civilization lasted? I'm sorry, the last slide. Yeah, last slide. About 2,000 to 1,500. So we're really only looking about 500 years. Now, there, a, go ahead. This is 3,500 to 1,000. Yes. So I was just going to say, there, there were um, kind of prehistoric Minoans oh, okay. living, but this, the culture that we're going to be looking at really had its heyday during 2,000 to 1,500. Um, they did exist before and after, but it's kind of like we don't really talk about this being Greece after the Greeks came and took over. It was, but it was really more Greece, right? Um, same sort of thing here. M Manoa existed afterwards, and people still live on Crete today. Do we call them Minoans? No. Um, so Crete, uh, Manoa still existed, and there were people here right around this same time here, um, but... It's kind of like talking about the, the very early Egyptians, right? Okay, so this is current day Crete. This is what it... And you'll notice we have these lines, volcanic arc, South Aegean volcanic arc, Hellenic trench. That'll come into play a little later on. We'll talk about some of the destruction of, of Crete. 
these are fault lines. So there was a lot of uh, volcanic activity and fault lines. There still is today in this area. Uh, not so much tsunamis. The Mediterranean is not big enough to create those, um, but there was definitely some seismic activity. How do you say that name, Sal? Aegean. Oh, Aegean. Aegean, yep. This is a map of current day Crete. So we just zoomed in here. Um, currently, there's all sorts of beautiful places here. Um, Knossos, this is where we're going to be looking at. These names in boxes, these are the main, four main um, cities in ancient Crete or in ancient uh, Manoa. Knossos was the biggest one, the most important one. Okay. All right, so Manoa, they themselves didn't call themselves Minoans. We don't actually know what they call themselves. Um, but we get a lot of information from, of course, a 20th century archaeologist, British, white guy who came in and said, here, I'm going to name all this stuff, and this is what I'm going to call it all. Um, he called it Manoa after the, the, the myth of King Minos, who is the keeper of the Minotaur. Have you guys ever heard of that myth? The Minotaur, the half man, half bull. There was that labyrinth, the palace, and they were... You know, he went in to rescue someone and right, all that stuff. Um, he found, he did this archaeological dig on the island of Crete and found remnants of this civilization. And so he called the people Minoans after this, after this myth. And King Minos probably did exist. There are records that, that tell us that King Minos existed. Was there a half man, half bull? Probably not. Um, but there's a lot about that myth that actually kind of starts to make sense once you start to look into it. He thought that these ruins were the magical labyrinth. Uh, and if you look at the ruins that he uncovered in the palace that we're going to be looking at, uh, you can kind of tell why he thought it was a labyrinth, why he thought it was this myth mythical uh, labyrinth. Now, this mythology existed in Greece, right? Greece is just to the north. And so we learn a lot about the Minoan civilization from the ancient Greeks and then also through excavations. So this myth of this palace and this labyrinth, it probably has its roots here in the Palace of Knossos, which we'll talk about more here in a little bit. Um, it was a great civilization. They had a lot of they have they had a lot of trade with partners. And again, what do we talk about when we need a civilization? We need a rule. We need some rules of law. We need a shared um, ideals. We need agrarian concepts, but we also need writing. And the Minoans had writing. And this is a, I'll just call this linear A, this alphabet. It's possibly a form. Um, we don't really know. Also, some of it made it. But again, we don't really know. These are archaeologists and historians' best guesses as to what the language means. But bottom line is, we don't know. We haven't fully translated and deciphered what all of this means, what linear A means. Um, we don't have a Rosetta Stone, basically. We don't have a starting point that, that we need to learn more about it. So are there still materials that are written in this that people can't understand? Can't figure it out. Wow. Yeah, we don't know. There's not a lot. Because, it, it, again, this the, broader, the most important part of the civilization only lasted 500 years. There wasn't a lot produced comparative to Egyptians, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we, a lot of it is best guesses, yeah. Can I picture before the hole might, might have, yeah. Oh, this? Oops, sorry, sorry. Yes. Oh. Ah! Yes, that one? Yes. OK, the, uh, is that how big it was? Yeah, it was big. OK, and, that, and did he uncover all that, or did he only uncover parts of it? Like, would he get, and then he just started to together with, like? Uh, so we'll, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of what it looks like today. So he was able to kind of figure it out so based. Was it all like underground? Was it no, but no. Of, so we, when he uncovered it, what does it mean he uncovered it? Well, over time, things get buried. So mudslides, you know, earthquakes, etc. Things just get buried over time. Um, there's Crete is a fertile area. It's a volcanic island, so it has lots of oil. Um, there was oil, still is today 
oil, wine, wool. Um, they were very adept at you know, using these natural resources. And then they also traded these natural resources as well. Um, it's surrounded by, surrounded by water. This is what the fairies look like today. This is what the fairies look like back then. So we've uncovered some ships uh, from the Minoan civilization, and they used these ships. Uh, they went off to the east, and they traded with what would be modern-day Turkey and some other islands in the Aegean. They also traded with Egypt down to the south. And so they were very much an economic powerhouse. They didn't have a strong army. They weren't really, they didn't have a very, very strong culture in the sense that the Egyptians did. Again, it only lasted 500 years, but they were economists. They were trading and moving their stuff over. Um, how do we know this? Well, we find artifacts, uh, Minoan artifacts, in all these different places. So they were there. They were trading. Yeah? What was the water like? Was it like that, or was it more? Depends on the day. Okay. But it could get like a like sea. Like totally. Choppy and sinking ships all the time. Yep. So again, I said that they're trading. So this is where we're looking at Crete. Knossos, um, we have found, we found um, remnants of some of their stuff down here in Alexandria. We found remnants here. We found remnants over here. Uh, so this is the Aegean Sea. So, but they were pretty, um, pretty active all through up in here, and all in this area, and definitely traded down in Egypt. Again, Egypt was the dominant power at the time. The um, Atlantic Ocean and Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Strait of Gibraltar, yes, it's, it's short, it's like a mile and a half wide. So if you're standing on the cliffs of, of Spain, you can see Africa. That's why it was such a strategic port, uh, strategic place. You could, yeah. Is it deep enough though for some big ships to go Yes, mm -hmm. okay. yep. How come they don't uh, consider the Aegean Sea and Ionian Sea? Why do they just consider that part of the Mediterranean? Um, that's what ancient civilizations called them. They would call the rest of the Mediterranean the Great Sea because it was big. Yeah. Um, but there's all these, I think this one's called the Cas Caspian, I think. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's over here. I'm not sure. Um, but there's all these different, you, you know, a sea is just a smaller part of another sea or an ocean. Um, so again, Knossos was very, very powerful in terms of its, its economy. It was prosperous. Um, and then there was trade. Herodotus, who is a, um, a Roman scholar, wrote that Minos established a thalassocracy, a sea empire. Thucydides accepted the trade of pirates, increased the flow of trade, and colonized many Aegean islands. Archaeolog archaeological evidence supports this because Minoan pottery is widespread, having been found in Egypt, Syria, Anatolia, Rhodes, the Cyclades, Sicily, and mainland Greece. So basically all around here. So they were all about trading. They were all about, again, getting their stuff out there. So again, going back to our concept of epistemology, how do we know that the, that the Minoans were a seafaring people? Because we find their stuff everywhere. How do we know that they were a powerhouse in trade? We see their stuff everywhere. They must have been doing it. So you can start to kind of piece together what a civilization is based on archaeological and art historical evidence. All right, what else can we tell? about whether or not the sea was important? Well, because they decorated with it. Simply. You don't spend time decorating something, especially if you're an ancient civilization, unless something is important to you. We saw that with Stonehenge, right? We saw that with, with the Egyptians. You spend the time on the things that are important to you. So we didn't talk much about pottery ceramics with the Egyptians. They did do some. But the Cretans were, or the, the Minoans were very adept at pottery and at ceramics. And we'll learn much more about this as we get into the Greeks as well. Um, but this is where we really start to see a whole culture of ceramics taking off. The Egyptians were using woven baskets and wooden vessels. Uh, they didn't use a lot of ceramics, but the Crete, uh, in Crete they did. And so we see decorations of you know, the sea of maritime life as well. This is probably the most famous artifact from the Minoan period. This is called the octopus flask. So this is a 
flask. It was probably used to transport olive oil or wine. Archaeologists will actually dig in there and grab little remnants from the inside and say, oh, this was a wine flask. Oh, this is an oil flask. Oh, this was used for transporting grain. Right? You can kind of tell what was inside of it. Yeah, for this one, we, we don't know specifically. It was probably oil or, or wine. Why? Why one of those two? Just by looking at it, how do you know? No? Ignore the, ignore the decoration, just based on the shape of it. Why? You can pour it out without spilling. It's not a big open vessel, right? You try to put this in your car, it's not going to spill. You try to put a big open vessel like a flower pot in your spill full of wine, it's going to spill. So they're using this to, to transport. So like, how did it break when they found all the parts? It the kind of broke in, in place. So it was yeah. covered under stuff, and then they were able to piece it back together. OK? Are those eyes on the octopus? Uh-huh. Yes. But the uh, octopus don't have eyes, do they? No, I've got the ones like the uh, squids, like squids do. I think it's a squid. It's a squid, but we call it the octopus okay. flask. Oh, I was going to say, am I supposed to? Sure. Maybe it's an octopus. Maybe it's a squid. I don't know. It's flask. Yeah. We know that the octopus was important for the Minoans because not only are we seeing it on vessels like this, but we're seeing it inside a lot of their temple complexes as well. The, the octopus to them <coughs> was an expression of the worship of the sea. It was a substance of life related to the movement and decoration. So again, based on what we're seeing, we can tell what they believed in. They didn't see it as a god, but they, were, they, were, they saw it similar to how Native Americans see the buffalo, right? This was something that was important to them. There's an animal that's life-giving, et cetera. Same thing with ones. This is the first time we are also seeing an, an animal uh, depicted very naturalistically, right? We've seen other animals depicted fairly well in Egyptian art, um, but this was this is very natural looking. And in fact, you even have seaweed and kelp, and maybe a sea anemone, maybe uh, uh, yeah, maybe one of those. But definitely, we're seeing kelp. This is this is made by people who had an affection for the sea. What's that? Had an affection for the sea for sure. Um, and it's also really well done, too, because it's not just here on the front. I'm just going to paint an octopus, and it's just going to be right here. It's all circling around. It's very well done, right? Um, it's very cool. All right, so let's look at the Palace of Knossos. We call it a palace, but only one part of it really was a palace. It was more of a kind of an urban complex. Now, commoners would not live there, but it would be open to the common people of the city as well, similar to how a castle would be in medieval times. Right? People can go in there for protection. People can go in there to store the grain. People can go in there to seek justice. This is sort of what this complex was. Same sort of concept here. There are lots of different levels to it. Um, there were storage areas for oil, olive oil. Again, very important. Lots of Olive trees are going to be growing in this area. Meeting rooms, possibly some ceremonial spaces, as well as the royal living quarters. This was an incredible complex of engineering as well. It had running water, all done by gravity. So they would have water tanks, and it would flow into the palace system. And in fact, they would have little gates in the bathrooms. You do your business, you open the gate, the toilets flush, right? So they had working toilets. So it was very well engineered. This is what it looks like today. Now they have recreated, this is not what it did look like when it was rediscovered, but they've recreated parts of it so we can kind of see what it looked like. But this is, you know, this is what it looks like today. From that. Archaeologists are really good. Uh, I couldn't tell you how exactly they know. A lot of them are educated guesses, for sure. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to see a remnant of a pillar, and it's going to have a little bit of red on it. 
and then you're going to see a remnant of a pillar on the other side with a little bit of red on it. They're going to go, okay, all the pillars are painted red. So why were they red? We know that. We don't know. Decoration. How do they know where to find these civilizations? Like, because it's so covered. Yeah. So how do they find it? Because they have to do a ton of. Usually word of mouth. Usually there's going to be people there who have been on the island. They'll say. You know, there were reports, you know, my great-grandfather told me stories of this place that he found one time when he was a little boy. Oh, it's over here. Have you gone and looked? No, I, I thought he was just crazy. So an archaeologist will go, all right, I'm going to go take a look. That's how most archaeologists find it. Usually it's the archaeologist, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the palace had a highly functioning water system. This was called the Queen's Megaron. So this is in your bold on there. The Queen's Megaron. This is, again, one of the more um, important works of art that are in the, that's in the Minoan uh, civilization. This is not recreated. This is how they found it. So they found it underneath, and they were able to carefully remove the dirt and the mud so from over time. The, you know how there's, like, the blue flower tiles? Uh-huh. When you go to the left, there's other yeah. tiles. Is that under it? I've wondered about that, too. I don't have a good answer for you. I don't know. Maybe it's redecorated. I don't know. It's like Maui's thingy. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, what can we tell? This is decoration, right? This is purely decoration for a room. This is the queen's room. The queen liked dolphins. Maybe it was just her aesthetic. Maybe the Minoans held dolphins as a important thing. You know, again, we don't know. The vessels that we find, again, have this wave pattern, right? Those are waves, stylized waves. I'm also going to draw your attention here. Oh, I don't know if I have an image of that. We might have to pull that up. I'm also going to draw your attention here. This is a priestess, which we'll talk about later, but she's in here as well. What's a priestess? A woman priest. We'll talk about that concept a little bit later. Um, you'll also notice... Um, None of you have been to the Mediterranean, I don't think. <clears throat> have any of you been to, that wasn't, that wasn't, a, that wasn't what it sounded like. <clears throat> None of you have been to But Southern California, you've been to Southern California, right? Yeah. Most of you. The climate in the Mediterranean is very similar to the climate in the Southern, Southern California. It's pretty temperate all the time, although it does get hot. So, but especially when you're near the ocean, what do you have? Sea you have the sea breeze coming in, right? It's very humid but it's also pretty cooling, right? That breeze that comes in, in the morning and then also in the evening. During the day, it gets hot. So the Minoans had, in the Temple of Knossos, they had these long, wide, flat roofs that overhang over the, over the openings, over the windows. What does that do? It lets wind in, but doesn't let wind out. It lets wind in. It, doesn't, it lets wind in and out, but what does it do? Shade, right? It provides shade. So these long flat roofs are providing shade from the sun, which is, which is very. I always do it. Good job. Okay. Calm down. Calm down. Okay, so we have these long flat roofs. Shh, 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 shh. Long flat roofs. What color do you want to paint them if you want to get rid of the sun? White. So the roofs are all painted white. They're all very flat, and it's keeping. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you have these windows. Again, they didn't produce glass. <coughs> we may have seen some glass, but not large panes of glass. So there's no windows that are glass. So what do they do? They have these massive shutters, which are now gone, but they have these massive shutters. So every room in the palace, especially facing the sea, has these shutters. You open it up, and basically you've got natural airflow and natural air conditioning going through the palace. And then when it gets hot and when it gets kind of stagnant and the, the breeze kind of dies down around noon or 1 o'clock, you close them. And it gets dark inside, and then the roof keeps it cool. And then in the evening, you open it back up again and cool the house down. Right? So again, very, very advanced engineering. Instead of just building a house, they're thinking about, all right, how do we, how do we cool this space? Because right? it, gets, it gets hot. You're in the, south, you're in the, you're in the middle of the Mediterranean. This is just a walkthrough of the palace. It's two or three minutes. And again, these are all recreations. Again, some of these details may not be exact. 
going to draw your attention to those things. We'll talk about those here in a minute. There's no sound on this, by the way. <laughs> it's walrus. But you can see how it's all very open. Wood. Yep. They used a lot of wood in their construction. The Egyptians did not. Why? Not the same time. Fire. It's natural resources. Because natural resources. The Egyptians didn't have the amount of wood, right? They had palm, but you can't really produce. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But it's multiple styles, or it's, I'm sorry, it's multiple levels, so you need the pillars to, to hold up the upper levels. This is so, so narrow. How did they design this? How did they find all this? So it was probably, and again, this long hallway is going to allow the air to come through, right? So the hallways may not be, the hallways may not be purely for, shh, shh, hallways may not be purely for walking. Sometimes they're, they're just there to let air flow through. It is, yeah. All right, so this gives you the concept. They're using wood and stone, right? First time we've seen this. And then you have these long porches, these long overhangs, and the roofs are painted, painted white. Okay, so we talked about the dolphin fresco a little bit, just to get caught up on our notes. There's a preference all over the place for aquatic motifs, meaning um, designs that are of the sea. Now, if you remember the very first class, I showed you that dolphin fresco when we were talking about what is art. Is that mural? Is that art? Is it decoration or is it art? I thought art was to decorate. Well, the purposes can be. But if it's purely decoration, is it art? What is, again, what is the intent of the art? Again, we, that's something for you to think about. We don't need an answer right now. So we don't know what this is. We have some pretty good guesses. So we know that there was a there was an activity because this is the most famous of them, but there are more like it called the bull leaping fresco that show the same activity. Um, young men and women appear to perform acrobatic feats with these animals. According to our best guesses, what they would do is a bull would charge towards them, and then they would jump, grab the horn, flip over the bull, or ride on the bull. Right. We'll talk about the red and white. We'll talk about the red and white here in a second. So why, why, are, why is some people depicted red? Why are some people depicted white? We'll talk about that. So was this, was this a religious thing? Was it a cultural thing? You know, kind of like in Spain, they have bullfights now. We don't know. We had something to do with their religion. Why? Because we're piecing a couple things together here. In a lot of these frescoes, we have depictions of these priestesses, which if I don't have it in the notes in the slideshow today, I'll, I'll recap it a little bit on Thursday. But there were priestesses that were very important and very prominent throughout Minoan culture. And they are depicted in some of these frescoes as well. Also, bulls are everywhere in Manoa. Not just physically, there's a lot of bulls. There was that too. But depictions of bulls are depicted everywhere. In fact, this is, um, this is called a labrys. I think I have it in your notes somewhere. They found that or they? They found it, yep. Um, I don't think I have put this in your notes. Sorry. So I'll just put it on here. Labrys. This is not a it is. You can cut with it. But it's highly decorative. It's made out of precious metals. It wasn't used for utilitarian purposes. 
Depictions like this are all over the place. And what this is is actually, yes, it's an ax, but it's also a stylized representation of the bull's horns. Because we're going to see some labrus, some labri, some labrum, I don't know what the plural is, I don't care, um, <laughs> that have a flat bottom and they just have the top two. Doesn't really make sense for utilitarian. Bull's horns. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see bull's horns all over the place. Remember I said when we were going through that, that view of the palace, those little spikes on the top? This is a larger one, and we're seeing this all over the place. This is off of the palace grounds. This is somewhere else. This is probably a ceremonial spot. And this is a depiction of a bull. And on the top of the palace, we have these depictions of bull horns as well. So the bulls were very, very important to the Minoans. How did they make them? Just carving a lot of stone. One huge block. Yep. Yep. But you can see here how the you can see here how the how the landscape how the landscape is different, right? Landscape is very different from landscape is very different from the Egyptian landscape that we looked at. There's lots of trees, lots of ability to to um, to bring wood in. Um, for some reason, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, so conventions. So down to your next bold point called conventions in Minoan art. We see some clear artistic conventions that read as a distinct style. This is a, there's a distinct style to Minoan art. Um, depiction of figures in profile, right? So in profile meaning to the side, so you just see them in the side. Not all of them are that way, but most of them are. Differing skin tones, so this is a recreation of that same fresco that we saw. The girls, the girls are white, the men are, are red. Almost always, in almost every fresco, you'll see red figures and white figures. The white figures are women, the red figures are men. Okay. And even in their statuary, the men would be, if you did a statue or a carving of a man, it's gonna be, they're gonna paint it with a pigment of red. No, that's just, that's just an art. The skin would be depicted red. Probably because men were outside and women were not. That's my best guess, but I don't know. Redneck. Basically. The men are more tan, women are not. Don't know. I don't know. And, and again, those are questions we don't know. Why would they choose those colors? In a lot of this art, there's, there's strong linearity. Linearity is an art historical term, meaning it's you know, left to right, right. There's a lot of story being told left to right. The Egyptian art is the same thing. There's, a, there's linear movement. There's a lot of movement as well, right? The unicorn. No, it's the walrus. Yeah, that's what I meant. Lots of, lots of movement. If you look at this, you can almost sense that this thing is moving. Shh, shh, shh. You can almost sense that this thing is moving. Is that like a sunset behind them? It's so cool. Possibly, yeah. They're very delicate. <coughs> very detailed. Their frescoes are done in a very detailed, dynamic way. A lot of, like, CG stuff. Yep. But this is also a depiction of, of the running through it, right? You see these palms that are all over the place? Good pineapple. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so a lot of detail. They're using a lot of calm colors, especially on the inside of, of the Palace of Knossos. A lot of these calming you know, decorative colors. These are the kind of the things that you would want in a, in a home that you're living in, right? So we see this dramatic shift from the Egyptians to the Minoans. The Egyptians, when they did art, it was all about depicting something that was important to them. And remember, we talked about how the Egyptians, if you put something, if you paint something on a, on a wall, if you, do a, if you do a fresco, that means it's real, right? It's almost like a magic spell in a sense. If you paint it, it's real, or you are maybe causing something like that to happen. So you don't do it unless it's important. Whereas the Minoans, let's do palm trees and dolphins, right? They would see art the way that we see art. Decorative, and yes, also telling a story, and yes, for devotional purposes. We saw that with the bull leaping fresco. We're seeing that with depictions of women and priestesses, etc. But they're also using it for just more mundane purposes. Mundane but beautiful, right? Just calm depictions of, of nature. So it's a, it's a radical shift, right? It doesn't seem like it at first glance, but it is a big shift from what the Egyptians were doing. 
Um, I will talk about the priestesses next time because I missed that, and apparently I missed the whole part about. I'll get to that. I don't know what I was doing. All right, the fall of Manoa. It fell, like all civilizations fall. Um, so let's get into Atlantis a little bit, the story of Atlantis. The Greeks talked about this island, this culture that was great at one time. And then it sank into the sea. And then later Greeks would even say, this culture still exists under the sea. Right? That's where we get the Disney cartoons, etc. cetera. Um, the Greeks, early Greeks, there were early Greeks uh, around during the end of the Minoan civilization, and they were writing about the Minoan civilization. Um, and so this is where we get a lot of information about them. The land that they called Atlantis did fall, and it did sink into the sea. If you look up here, there's a smaller island called Santorini. It still exists today. It's not the main island of the Minoans, but it is an outpost of the Minoans. And if we zoom in a little bit, this is a satellite image of it today. So this is, you can see, see the airport, and there's all these ports and these ships. It's a beautiful Greek island today. But earlier, it was a whole island. It was, it was a full island. And right in, you know. So what probably happened is there was this massive volcanic eruption. Most of the island of Santorini sank into the sea. Around the same time, we have the island of Crete being overtaken by the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans we're going to be talking about next time. Mycenaeans were a culture that were from ancient Greece, where Greece is today. They were kind of the proto-Greeks. They came down and they captured and basically destroyed a lot of the Minoan civilization. This happened right around the same time as this volcano destroying Santorini. Did they use it as kind of an excuse? Hey, this, you know, part of this civilization is in shambles because of the earthquake and the volcano and we'll do it. Did it happen roughly before? We don't know the exact timeline, but probably those two things played a part. Yeah. No. So remember the, the explorer that we talked about at the very beginning? He named this civilization the Minoan civilization after that King Minos. Okay. And then someone else just named the next So the Mycenaeans, we'll talk about them on Thursday. We'll talk about them on Thursday. So was the magical land very advanced peoples that sank into the sea? Yes and no. Crete definitely was, or, or you know, the main island of Crete definitely was an advanced civilization. Um, but that didn't sink into the sea. That was just destroyed by conquest. So I think there were two things that happened, and then this was conflated into this story of there was this magical place, there was this amazing island, and it sank into the sea. No, it was destroyed by violence. When it happened, was, was the island have sunk over a long period of time, or was it like really simple? Pretty quick. It happens pretty quickly. Wow. This is Santorini today. It's all volcanic soil. This is where you see those beautiful pictures of, you know, white Greek villas and all that kind of stuff. That's Santorini. Um, on my bucket list to go someday. Would love to go. Santorini, by the way, still an active volcano. So this is that, Thanks. this is the inside of that island that we saw before. Um, still an active volcano. There's some geological survey huts there, but besides that, no one lives on, on the island. It's small compared to like the map. Like you'd think like yeah. the distance between. Yeah, it's a very small island. Yeah, it's very, very small. So yes, part of the island did sink, um, and it is still active. Could it erupt again? Sure. We don't know. All right. We will look at Mycenae, or the Mycenaeans, next time. So you can see now why, you can see now why we chose to talk about epistemology here, right? How do we know what we know about the civilization? We can tell a lot through the art. We can tell a lot through the artifacts that are left over.